We're in uh, Acts, the uh, 23rd chapter right now, Acts chapter 23, and um, we have completed all of Paul's missionary journeys. They are behind us, 6,000 miles of travel. We have been through the council at Jerusalem, Acts chapter number 15. We uh, now find ourselves um, watching Paul the Apostle as he uh, gets ready to take his trip, uh, the final trip that's recorded in the scriptures, his trip to Rome. And of course, he has created a real stir in the city of Jerusalem back in chapter number 21. And uh, what's happened is he went there, um, kind of taking a chance. Uh, I know he'd been warned, he'd been warned several times about going there that it wouldn't, he would not be received well. And he saw this as a win-win situation. If I'm not received well and they kill me, I've done what I can do. I've fulfilled my purpose and my course as a uh, preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, if uh, somehow I survive that, I get an opportunity to witness and share in Jerusalem at Pentecost with thousands of individuals. And beyond that, who knows what will happen? Well, what happens is he gets arrested and um, for the... Uh, uh, the tumult that was created as a result of his testimony given there at Jerusalem at Pentecost. And now he's getting an all expense, or he's on his way to getting an all expense paid trip to the city of Rome. Now we're not there yet, but we're getting close to that. Uh, the actual uh, decision is made uh, by Paul. He appeals as a Roman citizen. You can't do this uh, to me. So I am not going to submit to your jurisdiction or your rule, um, the, the particular uh, Roman official. So I'm making my appeal as a Roman citizen. I have every right to appeal to Caesar for final judgment on this situation. So this is the path that we're on right now. Chapter number 23. We're on page 267 of our notebook. Consider for a moment, if you look at the intro, Consider for a moment this question. Would you rather live next to neighbors who call themselves Christian and never lived out the life of Christ in their lives? In other words, they lived like... I came across this word somewhere and I had to put it in my notes. Lugans. Or would you rather live next to an atheist who was a good, kind, and upstanding community citizen? And it isn't a trick question. Who would you rather live next to? Sometimes God's people get in God's way. Unfortunately, a Christian can become a detriment to the cause of Christ. There are two notable examples. First, by and through hypocrisy. Saying one thing and living another way is easily observed. And when we do, we get in the way of God. And second, by means of dissension and disunity. Two parts here. Inactivity or Apathy by Christians affects other Christians in a negative way. Lethargic Christians get in God's way. They discourage other people. Also, Christians can get in God's way by quarreling and fighting. And unfortunately, more energy is spent fighting with one another than is spent propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an important subject I think among Christianity among Christians and so I chose this chapter and the content of this chapter to be the springboard springboard for the thoughts that I've just shared with you you can see the outline of chapter 23 there and then we begin reading in chapter 23 verse number one Paul gets another opportunity to witness and Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest 
thou God's high priest? Apparently, Paul did not know that this individual was the high priest, or he pretended not to know that he was the high priest. Then said Paul, I wist not, I knew not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he knew that they had different theological takes on the truth. One was very conservative, one was very liberal. When he knew that, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, I'm a conservative, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now he knew that was a divisive issue between these two groups of individuals. The Pharisees were very conservative and like Paul, like them, believed in the resurrection uh, from the dead or of the dead. But uh, the Sadducees were very liberal. They did not. And when he is so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the multitude was divided. So now what he's done is, (coughs) excuse me, he's distracted them. They went there thinking that Paul was the enemy and just in a few words he's got them fighting with or angry with one another. For the Sadducees, liberals, say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. If you'll remember back in chapter number 5, in the early persecutions of the apostles, that Gamaliel gave the same advice to the uh, Jewish hierarchy back then. If this is a God thing, you fight it, you're wasting your time. If it isn't a God thing, the movement will evaporate. It'll be gone before you know it. Well, it's the same advice that's being given here by the Pharisees, that's their position. When there arose a great dissension, verse 10, the chief captain, Lysias, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down, to take him by force from among them, and to bring him into the castle. Well, we got to rescue this guy again. This is, it's really interesting, because here Paul has uh, these audiences with uh, the most antagonistic people that you could have an audience with, and he has military protection, security to protect him while he's witnessing to these uh, Jewish leaders. It really is kind of ironic, and you see how, how the Lord has used this whole situation and turned, as we said some time ago, turned a great uh, obstacle into a wonderful opportunity. And I, I mean, Paul has to be rejoicing at the way this thing is working out. Page 267, we've given you some, just some thoughts there uh, through the first 10 verses, some thoughts on what is said here, but the story of uh, Paul's trip to Rome is just beginning. The Lord reminds Paul of his missional objectives. Next stop, Rome. We're going to pick up in 23 verse 11. And the night following... The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, I have another assignment for you now. So must thou bear witness also at Rome. This is going to be your next stop. Thou must bear witness. That is what the mission in Paul's life was all about. Wherever he went, He was to be a witness. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, as we are also. Well, there's a conspiracy, obviously. These individuals have opposed Paul. They have uh, 
conspired to assassinate him already. They've been um, uh, uh, whipped up into a tumult, a lather, if you please, and they want. And if it wasn't for Claudius Lysias, the Roman government, uh, Paul probably would have been um, extinct. His life would have been extinguished by now. But God has a plan for the Apostle Paul. He's on his fourth, if I can call it that, his fourth missionary trip. And here on page 269, we read about, in 2312, the conspiracy to assassinate Paul. And what's this, these people are serious about eliminating him. 2312, and when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Well, they didn't get to slay him. I wonder if they've eaten since then. Anyway, now therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down, that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. So we're going to set an ambush for him. We're going to, we're going to, we counsel you. Make a request of Lysias that you would like to speak to Paul again. You want another audience with Paul. And... Um, the goal is not really to listen to Paul. The goal is on his way from the castle to our meeting place that we are going to eliminate him. We're going to assassinate him. Now, therefore, in verse number 15, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul, you better watch out, Paul. They're going to be laying. Here's the plan. They're going to be laying for you tomorrow. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, bring this young man under the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee with something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. This is a setup. They're setting you up and they're setting Paul up to eliminate him. But do not thou yield unto them. For their lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him and now are ready looking for a promise from thee. They're just waiting for a word that you will grant them their request and they'll be waiting in, uh, in an ambush to assassinate Paul. So the chief captain... Then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Well, certain of the Jews at the bottom of 269, this is nothing less than an assassination. But it's okay to break the law if you hate someone, <laughs> right? And that's what they're doing. They're breaking the law. They're taking the law into their own hands. Forty men, as a matter of fact. 
they came to the chief priests and elders and they become accessories to the crime. We'll be the bait so you can murder him when God's people get in God's way. Now that's kind of the theme here. Now, uh, in, I do not suggest to you that these uh, uh, religious, uh, Jewish religious leaders are Christians, but they are supposed to be God's chosen people, are they not? Well, they're not acting like it right now, and for, they're acting quite uh, to the contrary. So, uh, what is the point? The point is this, that they're willing to break the law to do something that, w- that will please them. Sometimes that's how Christians act. Willing to break the law or willing to break the morality, the moral code of Scripture, to accomplish something personal for oneself. That's one way that God's people get in God's way. When we act in hypocrisy, we justify our sin to accomplish our own desires. Now, Paul's sister's son heard. Uh, This is uh, Paul's nephew, and apparently this is all divine providence that's going on, not a coincidence. And so Paul is now knowledgeable of the plot, and he makes the the, uh, centurion... Uh, uh, he encourages his nephew to go to the centurion who then is brought to the chief captain and he tells him a story. Israel is represented by the leadership ironically was willing to break the very law which they claim to be protecting by the willingness, by their own willingness to kill Paul. And the irony is that a pagan military officer fulfills his duty by protecting the life of Paul from the religious, hypocritical leadership of Israel. So we pick up the story then in the 23rd verse of chapter 23. And he called unto him two centurions. That would, along with those, a centurion would be a a leader of 100 soldiers. So he calls two centurions, 200 individuals, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen, threescore and ten cavalry, that's 70 cavalrymen, and spearmen, 200, at the third hour of the night. This is 9 o'clock at night, 9 p.m. So uh, the... uh, Chief Captain is going to foil this assassination plot. He's going to move, he's going to move the uh, uh, object of assassination. He's going to move Paul from where he is to a safer place. And he's going to use about 470 soldiers, cavalrymen, and spearmen to accomplish this. <laughs> this is something, is it not? Provide them, verse 24, them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix, the governor. We're going up the chain of command now. And he wrote a letter after this manner, Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor, Felix, sendeth greeting. This man, Paul, was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now he's kind of uh, fudging a little bit on the facts here, having understood that he was a Roman. Of course, that came much later. But the way it's worded here, it sounds like he rescued him because he knew he was a Roman. Well, you know, words, how you arrange your sentences and where you put the facts within the sentence, etc., it can change the meaning, can it not? In fact, you can make a sentence to be tell the truth, but tell it in such a way that it makes you look better than you really are. That's exactly what Lysias is doing. And when I would have known the cause whereof they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. 
whom I perceive to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. These were religious issues. These were not civil issues that they were fighting over. And when it was told me how that the Jews, verse 30, laid in wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him farewell. So this is how I've handled this crisis. And of course he makes him look a little bit better in this situation than he probably was. So we're going up the chain of command now. We're ultimately going to end up in Rome at uh, Augustus Caesar's judgment seat. But here we go. The trip to Rome is begun. The tribune's supervisor or governor was a man named Felix. We've given you some facts there. Third hour, the seat of the government was in Caesarea. We learned that back in Acts chapter 10. That's where Cornelius uh, lived, and, that w- and he was a Roman soldier, and his conversion is uh, recorded there in Acts chapter number 10. So Lysias writes a letter to Felix. He's a little kind to himself in the assessment of his own performance in rehearsing the events, a little fudging there. We pick up the story then in 31 of 23. 31 of 23. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. Boy, the government's spending a lot of money in protecting this guy so he can witness. Well, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when then accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. And uh, good thing. Um, I really don't want to hear this case unless I hear both sides of this. So... I want to have a face-to-face confrontation. I want to see and I want to hear personally from your accusers, and then I will hear personally from you. And then I'll be able to bring a much more reasonable uh, decision as a result of all that's happening here. And that's wise, I believe, very wise on his part to do this. So... The first stop on the trip to Caesarea was at Antipatris. That was about 35 to 40 miles. And they took a break, bedded down, and then they sent the cavalry back to Jerusalem in the morning. So you can see the comments that we've listed there. And then uh, at the top of page 272, Felix says, He'll hear thee when thy accusers are also come. And so Paul then is placed under arrest or continues under arrest and he's in Herod's judgment hall. So um, some applications. Christians oftentimes become hindrances to the gospel rather rather than helps. And that is uh, the hypocrisy of the Jews, the elders uh, here in uh, this particular chapter in the chapter before They're willing to break the law to get what they want. That's hypocrisy. Oftentimes, Christians break Christian conduct, good Christian conduct, to get what they want. And then there are those that observe that and they discredit Christianity on the basis of of a Christian's hypocrisy when Christians get in God's way. Thank the Lord that the success of the mission is not all up to us. And we can see God's intervention constantly here in the life and the journeys of the Apostle Paul. God's will is accomplished by his grace and not by my strength. Thirdly, in what ways have you been? Stop for a moment, do a little self-examination. In what, in, in what ways have you been an obstacle to God's mission? Maybe you have... Um, Maybe you have relatives that need to be reached for Christ. Is your testimony 
pure and clean before your family members? How about before the people that you work with? How about the people that you go to church with? I mean, Christians can be obstacles to other Christians' growth. When Christians see other Christians taking lightly the truths of God's word, unfortunately, there's a tendency to drop to the lowest common denominator. If we're in a group of people that uh, are not very uh, militant about their Christianity, take uh, Christianity very lightly, maybe even make fun of some things in Christianity, talk, talk in a way about pastor, about the church, or about things that the church does in a light, sarcastic, um, demeaning way, that can, that can uh, discourage other people. It can discourage other Christians from being involved and being militant or being, being uh, uh, very involved in uh, different things in the church. So are you an obstacle? Have you created obstacles for other Christians? I've listed some things, hypocrisy, laziness, self-righteousness, sowing discord, all of those things can serve to discourage other Christians for being, for being the type of people that they ought to be. Well, we need to take another break here as we come to the end of chapter number 23. We're going to continue Paul's uh, vacation trip to Rome and his journey uh, as we come into chapter number 24 here in our next session. So let's, let's take a break right now.